Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Volker, Family Medicine and Geriatrics in the Des Moines University Family Practice Clinic. We welcome you to this year's 50 and Better Health Fair. Hi, my name is Katie Harbeck. I am a second year student here at Des Moines University. I'm also the president of our geriatrics club here on campus. We're so excited to be hosting you this year, um, even if not in person. Please stay tuned as our students and faculty provide you with information and knowledge on how to stay healthy and happy for this year and many years to come. Where I'm standing right now might look familiar to you. This is where we would normally greet you with the smell of hot coffee in the air. While we can't meet in person this year, we hope you can grab a beverage and some breakfast at home and join us over the next hour or so as we learn some new topics for those 50 and older. As I said, I'm a geriatrician and a family physician, so I see people of all ages, but I concentrate my practice on older adults, keeping you healthy and keeping in mind what matters to you. You can make an appointment in person or virtually at Des Moines University's clinic, 3200 Grand Avenue. So please have a pen and paper or a virtual notebook handy. If you have any questions, please jot them down along the way. Directly after the fair, we will be hosting a live question and answer segment via Zoom at 9 a.m. Central Time. If you have any concerns about reaching this segment, please reach out to questions at dmu.edu. Otherwise, sit back, relax, and enjoy the fair we have prepared especially for you. Hello, thank you for attending the 50 and Better Health Fair. We are the Internal Medicine Club here at Des Moines University, and we wanted to talk a little bit about blood pressure management. So my name is Danny Burris, and the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is the prevalence of high blood pressure. As you can see here, 45.4% of adults over the age of 18 in the United States have high blood pressure. So obviously it's a very common issue, and it's a huge burden on our health system right now. So what is high blood pressure? We typically define high blood pressure as having the first number or systolic blood pressure being greater than 130, or the second number or diastolic pressure being greater than 80. And so why is it a problem if your blood pressure is high? High blood pressure puts you at an increased risk for heart failure, increased risk for stroke, increased risk for kidney disease, and increased risk for heart attacks. So as high blood pressure or hypertension is a common problem, there's a lot of risk factors to be concerned about. Um, so some of them include older age, obesity, smoking, which can tra trace back to other cardiac problems as well, uh, a family history of hypertension, uh, high salt diet, physical inactivity, and excessive alcohol consumption. My name is Brandon, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, how you check your blood pressure and what you can do to lower your blood pressure if it is high. So starting out, um, what, what you probably think of when you think of checking your blood pressure is when you get it checked uh, at your doctor's office every, each year at your annual checkup. Um, and that definitely helps your doctor keep a good um, record of how your blood pressure is over the long term but it is just a snapshot of what's going on while you're there in the office. And so getting a simple machine um, like the one here in the picture, it, it can help you keep track of your blood pressure at home as well. And um, these are very simple to use machines and are relatively inexpensive. Um, basically you'll get, you'll just be able to put the cuff on or have uh, someone help you put the cuff on and press a button and it'll take your blood pressure for you. And so you can keep kind of a blood pressure diary um, and log your blood pressure over a long period of time, um, multiple times a day, and that'll help your doctor keep a good record of um, what's, what your blood pressure is doing when you're not at their office. And so uh, if, you, if you are monitoring your blood pressure and your doctor is monitoring your blood pressure and it does turn out that it's high, um, there are multiple different ways that you can use to try to lower it. Um, and starting out, your doctor is probably going to want to try some lifestyle changes. Um, and they, these kind of trace back to those risk factors that we talked about. So a high sodium diet was a risk factor. And so cutting back on sodium, having a low sodium diet um, and generally eating healthier is, is one lifestyle change you can make to try to lower your blood pressure. Um, low levels of activity was also a risk factor. And so trying to get in that routine exercise is another way to try to bring your, bring your blood pressure down, um, limiting alcohol and caffeine. Um, some other lifestyle changes would be to stop smoking um, and to um, 
uh, lose weight. And um, another um, lifestyle related change that has been shown to reduce blood pressure is to um, reduce stressors in your life, whether that is, you know, stress from work, um, or just generally learning to manage your stress better has been shown to lower your blood pressure. And so if you try these lifestyle changes and your blood pressure is still not um, where you or your doctor would like it to be, there are lots of the medication options that you can talk with your doctor about um, as far as lowering your blood pressure with medication. So thank you guys for your time. We hope that you learned something today. And if you guys have any questions or have any uh, concerns about your blood pressure, anything like that, be sure to contact your doctor and talk to them about it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brenna Ryan and I am a second lieutenant in the United States Army and a second year medical student at Des Moines University. Today, I will be representing the Student Association of Military Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons in a discussion of understanding post-traumatic stress disorder. What is PTSD? PTSD is a treatable psychiatric disorder that occurs when a person observes, experiences, or learns about a traumatic event. Previously known as shell shock, PTSD is no longer just restricted to service members. In fact, it occurs in 15 million U.S. adults each year. The trauma that can induce PTSD comes in a variety of forms. This includes things like natural disasters, being involved in war and combat, being taken hostage, being a victim of terrorist actions, being a victim of sexual or domestic abuse, and becoming a prisoner of war. The type of trauma can also be acute or chronic. If it is a relatively short duration, then we're going to see acute PTSD. But if someone experiences prolonged amounts of trauma, lots of trauma over a long period of time, repeated exposures, this can eventually develop into a complex form of PTSD that can often have a more severe presentation of symptoms and can sometimes be more challenging, although not impossible, to treat. There are various factors that can predispose someone to be more likely to develop PTSD. Some internal factors include identifying as female, have an attitude of self-blame, and having prior emotional or behavioral challenges. Some external factors that can contribute to this predisposition include encountering childhood adversity, having a prior exposure to trauma, either in childhood, adolescence, or adulthood, and most importantly, having a lack of a social support system. PTSD is diagnosed through a series of criteria. First, there must be exposure to a trauma of some sort, either through witnessing a traumatic event, experiencing a traumatic event, or learning about trauma faced by a close friend or family member. Secondly, we must see some sort of intrusion of this trauma into a person's daily life. This can come through the form of dreams, intrusive memories, or even flashbacks. What we also see is a persistent avoidance of anything that can set off these intrusive thoughts. So any situation, sound, person, or experience that might induce more of these traumatic memories to appear. Patients with PTSD often present with alterations in their mood and thinking. With thinking, this can manifest as inability to remember the details of their traumatic event or distorting the details of their traumatic event. With mood, this can come through not enjoying things that a person previously did, not connecting with people as much as they used to, and not being able to experience as many positive emotions. With changes to arousal and reactivity, we see that people can become hypervigilant, can have stronger reactions to surprises, and can even have more overt anger and outbursts. With arousal, we see a lot of sleep disturbance. Any presentation of these symptoms in some conglomeration for a greater than one month is highly indicative of PTSD. There are two primary treatment methods for PTSD, psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. Within psychotherapy, there are many approaches, including prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, to name a few. 
The goal of these different psychotherapies is ultimately to reduce anxiety, confront the trauma, and reshape the distortions that have occurred as a result of this trauma. With reducing anxiety, we see techniques such as meditation and breathing exercises to help the patient control their thoughts. With confrontation, we place the patient in a scenario where the trauma is reproduced, but in a more therapeutic way. With the presence of a therapist or with other guiding factors, we allow the patient to have more control over the traumatic environment. This ultimately allows them to accomplish the final step of reshaping their distortions. By working with a therapist in this safe environment, it's possible to remove the link that has formed between the traumatic stimulus and the fear that that patient encounters. One such way that this has been done was demonstrated in a small study in 2019, where 20 veterans of various ages and genders were exposed to video games as a form of confrontation treatment. This is just one example of how confrontation can be used. In addition to individualized therapy, we also see success in group therapy with PTSD treatment, as this allows for not only the confrontation of trauma, but also the use of social support systems to show patients that they are not alone in their struggles. Medications used to help treat PTSD include selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, or SSRIs, and prozosin. SSRIs are used to improve mood by leaving the molecule serotonin in a receptor synapse for a longer period of time. And prozosin is an antihypertensive agent which can help reduce the prevalence of nightmares. With proper treatment, PTSD has good outcomes, especially if patients avoid substance abuse, prevent additional trauma within their ability, and maintain good social supports throughout the treatment process. It should also be noted that since PTSD can occur simply through learning about the trauma that others have experienced, family and friends of those with current or prior PTSD should also consider seeking therapy to improve their quality of life. Thank you for joining me today as I discussed post-traumatic stress disorder. If you have concerns about yourself or a loved one, please reach out to a local healthcare provider as soon as possible and continue the discussion with them. Thanks again and have a wonderful day. Hello everybody, my name is Seth Kruger. I'm a current second year podiatric medicine student here at DMU. I'm the current president of ACPM, which stands for American College of Podiatric Medicine. And today, I have the luxury of speaking to you guys about diabetic neuropathy and general foot and ankle wellness. Let's get started. So a key stat that I found is diabetes affects over 100 individuals over the age of 50, which I just found mind-blowing. That's a lot of people, and I can't even conceptualize how much 100 million even is. So I want to start off, too, with some background. And I do realize that some of this maybe sounds scientific, but my job here is to kind of bring it down a little bit and make it so you understand what I'm trying to say. So diabetes is one of the most common chronic diseases known to date, and almost one third of these patients have been diagnosed with diabetic neuropathy. So diabetic neuropathy is kind of a vague term, which can be broken down into four major categories. So local, diffuse, somatic, visceral, or mixed. I'm not gonna get too into specifics about all these, but just know that these can be broken down even more into what type of pain you can be categorized as. So some of these pain can be, include noiseptive pain, inflammatory pain, or pathological pain. Basically saying that you may have something wrong with your nerves. Maybe you see some swelling and edema in your lower extremities, such as your foot. So it could be kind of puffy, red, warm to touch, or pathological. So maybe you have an infection there that's kind of stimulating something that may be causing something to hurt when you walk on it, or just even when you're laying in bed or sitting in a chair. So in diabetic neuropathy specifically, pain has been described as sharp, stabbing, burning, or pins and needles amongst others. So pain in diabetic neuropathy is one of the biggest things. So over 40% of primary care visits to podiatrists alone are, are patients complaining that their foot hurts or there's pain associated with their diabetes. So pain is one of the first physical manifestations of the disease as well. And it's usually an indication that something's going wrong or I need to see a doctor, something's going on inside of me that, you know, I don't know. 
and that can be described as a nociceptive pain, inflammatory pain, or pathological, which is to repeat is maybe a problem with your nerves, a decreased maybe stimulus going to your brain from your lower extremities as the foot, maybe there's some inflammation, or maybe there's an infection or something pathological going on inside. So next, I just want to talk about some pain management in diabetic neuropathy. So the treatment goals in diabetic neuropathy include pain modulation, enhanced glucose control, restoration of function, and then patient education. So with um, common methods of treating diabetic neuropathy, you kind of tackle the pain modulation, restoring of function, and education if you can follow the guidelines of when to take drugs and how to do it properly and safely. So one of the first lines is NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are things such as ibuprofen or naproxen, things that most of us are pretty familiar with, and they don't require a prescription. So you can get these over the counter at your local drugstore, such as Walgreens or even CVS. However, I want to talk about three main FDA approved drugs that will require a prescription from your local physician. And I'm going to start with pregabalin, otherwise known as Lyrica. So as I said, you do need a prescription to this, but it is one of the main methods of handling long-term pain. Um, this was the second approved drug for diabetic neuropathy because very effective in reducing chronic pain and pain related to sleep interference. So in diabetic neuropathy, a lot of patients present, say, they, I can't sleep at night. My foot hurts too bad. I'm getting this sharp, tingly feeling. It's burning. I can't fall asleep. So pregabalin is one of the main drugs that podiatrists specifically prescribe just for that. Next, we have duloxetin, which is known as Cymbalta. So this is chronic pain, and it works as an antidepressant. This is actually the first drug to be approved by the FDA for neuropathic pain with patients experiencing diabetic neuropathy. And it's also one of the most commonly ones that are still prescribed today. So if you need around-the-clock pain or you just can't do really anything, your daily tasks, without severe pain, then maybe a physician might prescribe an op opioid. Some of the, one of the most common opioids prescribed is Tepentadol, known as Nucentin, and that's the most common, but it is noteworthy of opioids that they do have a high risk of addiction and they do have long-term side effects. So if it's not too severe or maybe you didn't have a recent surgery, you probably don't wanna be taking these every day. However, they still are prescribed and some people still take them every single day. So you may be thinking, what if I don't wanna take drugs every day? As you know, pharmacological drugs do have a lot of side effects, and as you get older, you can have way more adverse effects. So these things, if you don't wanna take drugs, and you still have you know, type one or even type two diabetes, maybe you're a little overweight or your BMI is a little high, most doctors will recommend lifestyle modifications. So this will include increasing your daily exercise. So obviously, most people aren't gonna be lifting the heaviest weights in the gym or going for 10 mile runs every day above 50, but going for a walk, doing water aerobics, and eating a healthier diet. So having more protein and carbs and healthy fats and kind of staying away from the junk food um, can go a long ways. This could help control your HbA1c level, which is just known as your glucose, which most diabetics should be taking. Actually, all of them should be following um, and controlling their HB1, HbA1c excuse me, levels. So other things you can do is physical therapy, and this can focus on balance. Um, if you have balance, you can improve um, your risk your risk for ulcers. Ulcers are a big thing with diabetic neuropathy. So if you have pain in your foot and you have an ulcer forming, you probably won't notice because it hurts and you're probably not walking on your feet. And going to physical therapy and focusing on your balance can also lead to a decreased risk of like a hip fracture, um, which could lead to more adverse effects and things down the road, such as osteoporosis. So maybe you don't have diabetes, type 1 or type 2. There's still some general foot and ankle wellness things you can be doing. Go see a podiatrist. Get your toenails trimmed there. This can prevent infections. Maybe you have an infection that you think may look normal that they can find something. Moisturize your feet. Use aloe vera or cocoa butter. Those have been the two that have found the best, best results for maintaining moisture in the feet. Look at your feet. Don't ignore pain. Pain is an indication that something is going wrong. So some things you may notice are bumps, sores, decolorizations, or other abnormalities. And when it comes to footwear, wear adequate footwear. Make sure they fit the proper way. You have good support when you're walking. Go see your podiatrist regularly. We're not scary people. I'm not a podiatrist yet, but all the ones I've met are very nice people and they want to help. A lot of them get into this field to help with conditions like diabetic neuropathy and stay active. Staying active is one of the best things you can do. So in conclusion, diabetes is a rapidly growing disease that needs to be properly treated to promote adequate quality of life. You do have pharmacological factors, options that you can take pills, 
things as pregabalin, duloxetine, and tependidol, amongst others. There are non-pharmacological treatments such as lifestyle modifications such as exercise, diet, and physical therapy. And general foot and ankle wellness includes trimming toenails, moisturizing the feet, seeing a podiatrist, wearing adequate footwear, and staying active. So that brings the end of my presentation. These are my references. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Dustin, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the president of Pride Alliance here at Des Moines University. Hi, I am Laurel, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the vice president of political advocacy here at the Pride Alliance at DMU. So today we're going to be doing a presentation about pronouns and why they've become more prevalent recently in modern culture. Have you noticed? Many people are including their pronouns in their email signature, social media profiles, and even when they're introducing themselves, especially at the doctor's office. Some people even wear pronoun pins or stickers on their lapels or their ID badges. And some people can find this very confusing and since it's so new. Um, so the questions we have today are, why has this practice become so common recently? And why should you take part? So why is this practice of using pronouns regularly become so important? Well, not everyone identifies with the gender they were assigned with at birth. You might know someone in your community who doesn't identify with gender they were assigned with at birth. They may have transitioned at some point in life and identify with different pronouns. Um, letting others know of your pronouns can help everyone, including them, feel respected and included in your community. It has been proven that respecting people's names and using the, the pronouns they share with you both improves their quality of life and improves trust in your relationships with them. No one wants to feel left out. So how do you respect the identities of others? Step number one, reflect pronouns. When someone tells you that they, how they wish to be addressed, utilize the pronouns and name that they provide. It's that simple. And you don't be afraid to ask a person how they wish to be addressed. Some people can appear more androgynous than others and make be confusing to you. And it's okay to ask them what their preferred pronouns are. Um, they would rather you ask them than to refer to them as the wrong gender. That's perfectly fine. And if, someone's pro if you do get someone's pronouns incorrect and they correct you, that's also okay. Just begin using the pronouns they identify with afterward. Sometimes life can be confusing, but as long as you make up for it in the end, that's all that matters. Yeah, and when it comes to someone's identity, uh, pronouns are an essential part of someone's identity, just like their name. Um, for example, if I told you my name was John and you just started calling me Jack, that would not be very respectful. I, I said my name was John and that's what my name is. So make sure to use um, a person's name and pronouns that they share with you. Here's an example of a culturally responsive intake form. These types of forms are increasing in popularity and you may have even filled one out yourself at your last checkup. This form asks about a patient's name, pronouns, gender, and if it's for medical purposes, the sex assigned at birth. These types of forms can help front desk staff, nursing staff, and providers better communicate with patients while maintaining the patient's comfort. It is very common to feel uncomfortable at the doctor's office, and for transgender or non-binary patients, this experience can be even worse. Many patients that do not feel comfortable with the way that an office treated them because of their identity will not return for additional care. Respecting patient pronouns not only improves communications with patients, but it improves trust and ultimately improves patient outcomes, which can save lives. Yeah, and utilizing the pronouns uh, a patient provides leads to um, uh, improved patient-provider relationships and uh, impacts in the future. So to summarize it up, this might seem small in nature, but in the grand scheme of things, it does make a big impact. You might have long-term friends, children, or even grandchildren who have recently identified as a different gender than you previously knew them as. By utilizing pronouns or sharing your pronouns, you can help them and everyone else in the community feel more included and respected. Don't be afraid to ask people what their pronouns are. Um, additionally, when you adopt this practice, someone close to you might feel comfortable enough to tell you uh, more about themselves that they might even identify with a different gender. So at the end of the day, 
Um, by sharing your pronouns, you can help others feel more respected and included. When you go to community events, don't be afraid to introduce yourself, of course, of your name, but also your pronouns. Uh, so for example, for me, I would say my name is Dustin Nguyen, and my pronouns are he, him, his. It's a very simple uh, task, and it helps others feel included. Thanks for watching, and um, we have some references here if y'all want to check out the CDC website if you need more information on this. And just remember, respecting pronouns can save lives. At Des Moines University's Family Medicine Clinic, our goal is to provide you with compassionate care that is comprehensive. From caring from children to the elderly, our medical team provides holistic preventative guidance on how you and your family can maintain a healthy lifestyle and manage any symptoms that may arise so that you can be at your best. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, maintaining your health as well as a safe lifestyle has never been more important. Our providers are here to help when acute conditions affect you or your family. We treat musculoskeletal injuries, infections, illnesses, and many other medical conditions. As an academic medical center, DMU is training tomorrow's healthcare providers on how to provide expert care to people from all backgrounds. We invite you to visit the Family Medicine Clinic at Des Moines University. We offer the care and attention you deserve. Welcome to the Dermatology Club's presentation for the 50 and better Fair of 2021. We apologize that we're not able to provide any skin exams this year, but we're hoping that we will be able to provide you with some information on aging skin that may answer your concerns, any concerns that you are experiencing, or prompt you to schedule a visit with your provider. During this presentation, we will discuss several common skin lesions, both benign and malignant, but as a disclaimer, this is meant to be an informative presentation, and it is not meant to override any medical advice that you receive from your doctor. So our first condition that we are going to talk about is pruritus. It's defined as the unpleasant sensation of the skin that provokes the urge to scratch. Acute itching, which lasts less than six weeks, may provide a protective function, but a chronic itch that lasts more than six weeks is mostly a nuisance. The prevalence of pruritus increases with age and can be partly caused by a decline in the normal physiological status of the skin. It can be local or generalized with or without a rash, and it can occur anywhere on the body. Cirrhosis is the name for the medical name for dry skin, and by the age of 70, nearly all adults are affected. In fact, cirrhosis is the most common cause of generalized pruritus without a rash in the older adult population. However, pruritus um, is caused by many things, including drugs, for example, certain blood pressure medications or antibiotics can cause an itch through multiple mechanisms. Additionally, certain inflammatory skin diseases, eczema, cirrhosis, insect bites, burns, scars, irritants, or allergic reactions, just to name a few, can cause pruritus. Although it can be difficult to difficult to identify the cause of pruritus, the treatment is fairly straightforward after the origin has been determined. Treatment consists mainly of removing or avoiding the offending agent or allergen in conjunction with the use of a topical or systemic drug. Next, we have astyototic eczema. Astyototic eczema is a dermatological condition that usually begins its dry skin, and as the disease becomes more severe, the skin can crack and cause fissures. These fissures are a result of epidermal water loss. The fissured skin is in a polygonal pattern, as you can see here. These lesions can appear as red, dry, flaky patches that are local or generalized and are more common on the lower legs as well as the thighs, the chest, and the arms. It's a common condition that affects mostly older adults in dry, cold climates. The early recognition can lead to treatment and avoidance of secondary lesions and infections. It's diagnosed clinically and skin hydration is the primary treatment for osteototic eczema. 
short, cool showers with a mild, fragrant-free soap and the use of petroleum-based creams, such as Vaseline or Aquaphor, can be helpful. Next, we have rosacea. Rosacea is a long-term disease that causes redness, reddened skin, and pimples, usually on the face. It can also make the skin thicker and cause eye problems. Rosacea usually um, causes the face to become red and flushed. And it can cause, it can may look like um, you may have the redness at the center of your face, including the forehead, the nose, and the cheeks. Women are more likely to get rosacea, especially during menopause, and it prevent, presents um, on the cheeks and the chin, whereas men are more likely to have the symptoms of rosacea on the nasal area, on the nose. Individuals with rosacea may experience bumpy skin or pimples, and the skin can also feel swollen, warm, or even like it's burning and these symptoms can come and go. There is no cure for rosacea, but treatment can help make your skin look and feel better. Your doctor may suggest antibiotics that you apply directly to your skin or that you take in a pill. Next, we have psoriasis. Psoriasis is another condition of the skin frequently seen in older adults that causes the body to make new skins in days rather than in weeks. It's characterized by red patches with a white scaly surface and can sometimes resemble eczema. These patches are of varying size and often affect the scalp, but can commonly also affect the knees, elbows, and other joints. Some individuals can present with more generalized psoriasis include, that will affect much of the body. It tends to have a symmetrical distribution, meaning that it can occur on both sides of the body. There's many treatments available and treatment is individualized for each patient based on other comorbidities that they may be experiencing and the potential adverse effects. But topically applied medications such as corticosteroids are the first line therapeutic option in older adults. And lastly, I wanna mention skin cancer. Older adults are at an increased risk due to a variety of factors, including the cumulative sun exposure from a lifetime in the sun. Skin cancer will usually present as a spot, a freckle, or a mole that is visibly different to the skin surrounding it. And it's often a new spot, but it can, the skin cancer can also present in a pre-existing spot that has changed color, size, or shape. There's several different types of skin cancer, including basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. As these conditions can be life-threatening, if left untreated, early detection is very important. Knowing your A, B, C, D, and E's may help identify when a mole may be cancerous early on. And so A stands for asymmetry. And this is when um, it may be malignant if half of the mole does not match the other. B stands for border. So you wanna see if the edges are irregular, jagged, or blurred. C stands for color. The mole of the color is not always the same and it can include shades of brown, black, and sometimes these, the mole can even include some pink, some white, or red coloring. D stands for diameter. The mole is greater than six millimeters across, which is about the size of a pencil eraser. And lastly, E stands for evolving. The mole is changing in size, shape, or color. It's important to remember though that some cancers do not fit these rules. These rules. So if you do notice any new skin changes, please tell your doctor about them. So thank you for taking the time to watch our presentation. Please remember that it was meant to be informative only and that if you have any concerns regarding anything on your skin, please seek the advice of your healthcare provider. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for attending the 50 and Better Health Fair. My name is Cole Crawford, and I represent the Physical Therapy Club here at Des Moines University. Today, I am gonna talk about the fear of falling how to overcome this fear and get you back to doing the things you love. So what is the fear of falling? It's a person's anxiety towards walking or moving with a perception a fall will occur. This is a common fear as we get older and start to lose confidence in our body's ability to perform everyday tasks. This fear can come from a past fall or a person may be starting to have balance issues to avoid activities they think might cause them to fall. So why is this important? The fear of falling actually leads to an increased risk of falling. People who have the fear of falling tend to be less active and being less active leads to functional decline, reduced ability to move and loss of independence. When people have the fear of falling, they tend to take shorter steps and walk more slowly. 
but this is actually more dangerous than your normal walking pattern when it comes to fall risk. It can also lead to anxiety and, and depression because they have the thought that their body is failing them. They could be socially isolated from friends and family and reduced activity has a negative impact on your mental well-being. How would you be able to recognize that you have a fear of falling? This is something that a person might not want to admit to, but recognizing this fear could be the first step in preventing any future falls. Maybe you notice you are inactive because you are afraid that you will fall if you walk the dog. You may be having balance difficulties, so you avoid going to a child or grandchild soccer game. Maybe you're having difficulty walking, or you're embarrassed that you walk differently, or you use an assistive device. So you decide not to get a cup of coffee with a friend. There are so many examples of when you avoid movement, you miss out on life. Don't let this fear overtake your life. If you have any of these conditions below, consult your doctor so you can come up with a plan to take control of your own life. Where to start? First, consult your doctor. Test your vision and hearing frequently because they play a big role in balance and coordination. Go in for regular health screens. Review your medications with your doctor. Some medications can cause dizziness and balance difficulties. Make sure your doctor knows that you plan on beginning exercise and if you are able to do so. Consult your physical therapist. Physical therapy provides a safe and judgment-free environment with trained healthcare professionals that help you regain your confidence and independence. Your physical therapist will be able to answer any questions you have about falling, balance, exercise, functional activities, and so much more. They will help you reach your goals and give you the tools to take back your life. Activity is key in preventing falls. You will hear me say that over and over again throughout this presentation because of how important it is. Joining an exercise class is a great way to be active and be in a community of individuals trying to better themselves. There are so many examples of classes available to the community. I have listed a few, but you can always let, ask your doctor or physical therapist to see what they recommend. Home modifications, throw rugs or tripping hazards, so pick them up. You might get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Have nightlights in the hallways, bedroom, and bathroom so you can see where you're going. A lot of falls occur in the bathroom, so non-slip shower mats, grab bars, and shower seats are always a great idea. Use the handrail on stairs. And rolling chairs are dangerous because they can move when you sit down or get up. You want to sit on a stable surface. Personal modifications are things you can do in your own personal life that can make an impact. First one, be active. I said it again. We like to say motion is lotion. If you don't move and be active, your body will break down and cause further complications. Be social. Mental health is so important for everyone. Stand up slowly. If you get lightheaded when you stand, wait for it to go away before you begin to move. Make sure you are getting enough sleep. Wear good shoes. Slippers and sandals do not provide the support your body needs. If you do feel unsteady, use an assistive device like a cane, walker, or walking sticks. There is no shame in using these devices. They are there so you can continue doing the things you like to do without the fear of falling. And nutrition. Eat healthy and treat your body right. I just wanted to end this presentation with a quote I found. It says, don't let the fear of falling keep you from knowing the joy of flight. Take charge of your own body. Don't let the fears keep you from seeing the people you love or keep you from doing the things you love to do. On behalf of the Physical Therapy Club, we thank you for attending this presentation. Hi, my name is Connor. I am a second year DO student here at Des Moines University, and I'm also the president of the Emergency Medicine Interest Group. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about a really simple but important topic, and that topic is going to be when should you go to the ER? 
And I'm sorry that we couldn't do this in person, but I'm really happy to be a part of it. So uh, thanks for coming and listening to me talk about this. So let's get started with a couple of interesting stats here. And I just kind of wanted to highlight the use of the ER in the United States. So 130 million visits to the ER occur yearly. And to put that in perspective, there's about 320 million people in the United States. So uh, a one third of, of that number um, is, is how many visits happen yearly. Now that's not, multiple visits can happen by one person, but still it's a really interesting statistic. Um, another statistic is that 60 out of every 100 people over the age of 75 visit the ER yearly. So the ER is there, it's a great resource. Uh, to utilize if you need it and it's always better to be cautious if you are having issues that you feel like they need to be addressed so just kind of want to use that to highlight this a little bit so the main point of this presentation is basically if you're having any symptoms um, it's always best to get help to talk to someone and that might be your primary care physician that might be through calling 911 that might be go through going to the ER um, but it's always best to talk to someone talk to a medical pro professional and uh, you know, get their input and expertise about what's happening. So here is a uh, list of common symptoms that might lead to an ER visit, and it's in no way meant to be complete. I think that could be 40 slides long if I tried to address every um, symptom that could lead to an ER visit. But if, if the general idea is if you're having anything that's really concerning, it's always best to go to the ER or to seek help in any way. But let's go over a couple of these symptoms here. So um, chest pain or discomfort or any pain that radiates to the arm or jaw as well um, is concerning. Uh, difficulty breathing or choking, an injury or fall, which includes uh, burns, bleeding, broken bones, and things like that. Um, and it's really up to your discretion if you wanna utilize the ER or your primary care or an urgent care facility for this. But if it's concerning you, or you know, seems like a, a large injury, always utilize the ER for something like this. Um, seizure, passing out, any sudden or unusually painful headache, um, any signs of stroke, and we'll go over that in the next slide. Uh, weakness, dizziness, confusion, blood with cough, throwing up or in stool. Um, again, use your discretion for things like this. High fever, especially if that fever is not improving with any medication use is important too. Um, vomiting, diarrhea that's severe or it's not improving, um, and then suicidal thoughts or poisoning or overdose of alcohol or drugs. All of those things are really important to go and seek help if you're experiencing that or if you know someone, a friend, family member that's having, uh, that's experiencing those symptoms as well. Uh, so I think this is a really important thing for anyone to know um, for your sake and for, a, you know, uh, like I said, friends, family members to know these things as well. So this uh, three major signs of stroke can be uh, detailed with this FAST mnemonic. So F for facial drooping, A for arm weakness, and then S for speech problems. And then the whole thing is uh, act fast, um, time to call 911 with the T. So uh, if you're having any of those three symptoms, or if you have a friend or family member that you're with that's experiencing those symptoms, it's always best to seek help. So here's the slide with just some general tips. Um, again, when to call 911 if you have anything that's really concerning, um, or if you have concerning symptoms and you really have no way of getting to um, getting to the ER. Uh, to you know, utilize 911. They're there for a reason. Um, you know, we want you to get help. We want you to be cautious. Things like that. For uh, some other tips of it's it's good to have these phone numbers easily accessible. That if you need them, you can you can try and call and get some advice. Um, and that's going to be like a, fa a family or close friend, especially if they can help you with transportation or uh, be there if you're, you know, if it's concerning. But again, utilize 911 if you need it. Um, your primary care provider, again, if you had uh, any concerns that weren't really, um, weren't very severe or, or anything like that, that you wanted to just give them a quick call, it's really good to know those things. Good to have a medical professional on board with your treatment and they'll kind of guide you along with it. Um, some insurances offer something like a hotline or a nurse uh, phone number that you can call and they will give you some advice. Uh, and it really depends on what, what insurance you have and if they offer it, but it's something to look into if, that, if, if you'd like to. Uh, another, uh, another good thing to have is have these items kind of written down um, and easily accessible by you and maybe a family member too. Maybe have uh, any family members that you're really close with, uh, they, could kind of, they could have these things easily accessible as well. And 
some apps do things like this too. So uh, there's all there's multiple options, but a medication list, an allergy list, and then kind of also location of your closest emergency department is important for you as if if you were in an, your own situation. But if you were with a friend or family member that needed help as well, that's good to know. So in conclusion, if you're concerned, it's always best to get help. I can't say this enough. I we want you to be cautious. So. Uh, use your discretion, but if you are having concerning symptoms, it's always look in looking. It's always good to look into options for getting help. And this is the last page with just some references for um, information I use on the slide. But thank you so much for listening to me, and I hope this presentation was somewhat helpful and answered some of your questions. But um, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Good day, everybody. My name is Scott Chanthon Pip, and I'm the president of Podiatric Medicine Advocacy. And I want to welcome you to this virtual 50 and better fair today. And uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to present information to you. And hopefully, you find this information useful and enjoyable throughout this uh, presentation. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization, Podiatric Medicine Advocacy. We were founded in 2014 at Des Moines University, and our mission to, is to inform the community of the roles and values of podiatric medicine, promote the idea of equivalence over other healthcare fields, and educate health-interested students on the benefits of becoming a foot and ankle specialist. Here are some images of some of our students working on other students in the community, teaching them about our field and profession, trying to get them interested in to podiatric medicine. So today I'm going to talk to you about HbA1c. What is it? So HbA1c is a test that measures the amount of blood sugar or glucose over the past two to three months. And then hemoglobin is a protein found in red blood cells or RBCs. It gives blood its red color and its job is to carry oxygen throughout your body. So when the glucose builds up in your blood through diet or body secretions, it binds to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. And the A1C test measures how much glucose is bound or glycated protein. So the RBCs live for about three months. So the test shows the average level of glucose in your blood for the past three months. And the normal range for HbA1c is between 4 to 5.6%. So what if your HbA1c is greater than 5.6%? So indications of diabetes heart disease, and liver disease. The higher HbA1c is, the higher your risk of having complications related to diabetes. Complications if HbA1c is not regulated. So diabetic neuropathy. Neuropathy is disease process where there's damage to your nerves and it can eventually lead to loss of sensation throughout your body. Uh, specifically in our case, uh, losing sensation to your feet. A retinopathy is a disease process where there's damage to the retina of your eye, um, also including the small blood vessels in your eye, which can lead to a blurred vision and eventually, and sometimes possibly, uh, vision loss. Nephropathy is a disease process where there's damage to the kidneys, and which can also eventually lead to a kidney failure. And cardiovascular diseases are really high in the U.S. These can include a heart attack, stroke. Um, heart failure and also arrhythmias and poor wound healing is another important one that includes uh, not being able to fight off infections different things like that so here are some images of some things the retinopathy uh, the poor wound healing in a patient with the diabetic foot ulcer some other poor wound healing So treatment and prevention. First, diet is really crucial to treating a high HbA1c. I know everyone's diet is especially different and they may have different restrictions, so consult with your dietitian or primary care provider to figure out what diet works best for you in helping decrease that HbA1c. Um, secondly, exercise is really crucial as well. Um, it's going to vary for what your abilities and capabilities are for exercise programs, but we prefer at least two times a week. 
and take your medications on a regular basis. Especially if you are diabetic, make sure you're taking that diabetic medication. And make sure to check your HbA1c with your primary care physician every two to three months or at your annual physical exam. And if you are diabetic, schedule a regular checkup with your local podiatrist for any wound infections. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to present to you today. I'm grateful for that. And I'm thankful that you were able to come to this 50 and Better Fair. Please, uh, if you have any questions, reach out to us. And have a great day. Hello, my name is Brandy, and I am part of DMU Sigma Sigma Phi's Honor Fraternity. Welcome to the 50 and Better Virtual Health Fair. Today, I'd like to talk to you about social health and COVID times. So what is social health and why is it important? Well, having a healthy social life means engaging in consistent, meaningful interactions with the people around you. Socializing matters because it provides multiple benefits to your mental, emotional, and physical health. Some of the health benefits include reduced stress levels, reduced risk of depression, and a longer lifespan. Social interactions can help prevent memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, and some forms of dementia. Overall, maintaining your social health will lead to a better quality of life. Here are some more benefits of maintaining your social health. On a consistent basis, Engaging with another person helps keep you stimulated intellectually and sharpens your mentality. Studies have shown that one of the greatest ways to prevent dementia and other forms of cognitive decline is simply to talk with other people. The act of having a conversation improves neuronal connections in your brain and increases your intellect. When social activities include exercising of any form, you can receive the benefits of both to significantly increase your overall health and prevent disease. So how do you even socialize in COVID times? Well, as we wait for the pandemic to pass, there are still ways for you to connect with others. Thanks to technology, using a phone to video chat or call is a great way to socialize. Some video chat ideas include cooking dinner together, watching movies, or even going for an outdoor walk while video chatting. More ways to stay connected. Luckily, Many popular board games have gone virtual, allowing you to play online with anyone, anywhere. Some examples of popular online games include Monopoly, Chess, Yahtzee, Crazy Eights, and many others. You can consider going on a trail, using appropriate distance and masks with someone in your life to enjoy each other's company and nature. The good news is you can start today and here are some suggestions. Try to get 20 minutes of fresh air and sunlight each day. You can send letters to loved ones. Attend socially distanced outdoor activities or exercise groups. Consider attending family game nights or dinner nights through video chat. Call a friend and see how they're doing. And of course, try to get seven to nine hours of sleep so you're ready for social interactions. You can consider adopting a pet because interactions with animals are still social. And finally, try to spend some time outside, walking, sitting, and gardening. In summary, 
you are not alone and it is beneficial to stay connected with others and your community as a whole. Social and mental health are real, tangible aspects of your overall health and they can directly impact your physical health. Socialization helps you prevent disease and live a fulfilling life. And finally, there are many ways to engage with others and you can start today. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you for tuning in with us this morning. We hope you have lots of questions prepared for us students and DMU providers. And please click the link below to join our question and answer session this morning at 9 a.m. sharp. Thank you.